Good morning. My name is Becky Robinson. I'm the president and co-founder of Alley Cat Allies. And with me today is Kayla Cristiano, and she's at the National Cat Help Desk of Alley Cat Allies. And we are going to do this presentation together today. And some of you heard me last night, and I'm going to cover just a little bit of the same thing just for, because we're taping this today, but then I'm going to pass this off on to Kayla. And when, uh, when Ellen and Anne and I worked on what the topic would be for today from Alley Cat Allies, one of the things that Alley Cat Allies knows and has created for the country, we're a national organization and we're uh, we're devoted. We, we started 25 years ago when nobody had any resources, nobody was connected. And now today, of course, we know that there's hundreds of thousands of people caring for cats and that are networked and created their own groups. And some of them have grassroots groups and some of them have formed even larger nonprofits <clears throat> like Indy Farrell. So, what we're known for, Alley Cat Allies protects cats. We believe that there should be an advocacy base in every single community to protect cats, and we're gonna talk about why. And uh, since we started, we know that there's an interest because we have a half a million supporters today, and people want information, they want help. The thing that we have found, and the reason we still have National Cat Help Desk is because, believe it or not, a lot of people still don't know what a community cat is. They don't know about unsocialized feral cats. And so when they see a cat, of course there are stray cats outside, and some of those stray cats join up with colonies. That's what they are, family groups. That's, again, you're gonna hear me say things that we want you to absorb and use into your messaging. So a lot of you might be here because you are the one that's answering the phone, or you're out in the field. Um, maybe you're creating a program. Uh, for the public, but some of you might be responsible for training others of what to say, like your receptionist and your customer service and your field representatives. So we're gonna try to give you some of that information. So that's what we're really good at, and we know this because out of all the people who have contacted us, many of them have gone on to start their own groups. So when they call, when they call us and they, they ask for help, and they tell us there's a cat or a mother cat and kittens. A lot of people still think that taking cats to shelters is a good idea. Now obviously we know we're in Austin today and there's a lot of really great resources for cats here and, and in, in other parts of Texas. But for cats outside, and even if it's a stray cat that's hooked up with a colony, Taking a cat to a shelter in most shelters in this country is still a death sentence. So when they call us, they want help, but they usually think they're gonna make a phone call and hang up. And so what we're saying to them, we have kind of an internal slogan, it's kind of tag your it. So that's why we're here today, because we want people to understand that this is a grassroots movement, and even though there might be resources in their area, in a lot of places, it's still going to be up to them, that that cat's life depends on their actions and what they're going to do. And it is a choice. It's a choice that they can do something. They don't feel like they can. They never heard of trap to return. They've never heard of a humane box trap. They've never heard of socializing kittens. But guess what? We have all the fact sheets. We have ways to help them. So just real quickly, everybody knows that cats have been living around us for 10,000 years. They are the, the only domesticated species, domestic animal, that uh, is self-domesticated. So you can see that this is just a timeline that I'm showing on the screen here, that they've lived around us even long before they, we knew that they were do the domestic cat in Egypt. They were actually thousands of years prior to we have now have research to show that they um, uh, lived around people and their domains. Um, all the way up to uh, present day, you have to think about it was just, uh, what, 150 years ago that there was the first cat show, and it was only about 50, 60 years ago that cat litter became a marketable item that people kept cats in their homes. So cats have always lived around us, and they are always going to live around us outside. That's a fact of life. It doesn't have to be a sad fact. It's just a fact. So here they are. There's millions of unowned cats, and so this is what we have to keep in mind, that what we're doing at, at 
what we're doing every day at Alley Cat Allies and what all of you doing are out in the field is that we're, we're, we're correcting a horrible myth. And this myth is that the only way a cat can live is indoors. And that's just not correct. So that's what we're kind of undoing. This is a, a, an animal. The cat decided to be around us. They came to humans and they decided to hang. It was a very symbiotic, symbi symbiotic relationship. It was very, um, for them, cats look at what they can get out of a relationship. So we kind of have to think about how they're going to survive. And this is very hard for people when they call us. They don't quite know, um, you know, what should I be doing? I should be bringing them in. And I've heard people this weekend talk about how people brought in feral cats and they're still inside. And of course, the cat's unhappy, the person's unhappy, and the family's unhappy, and this cat's not going to be socialized. It's going to take... For most cats, it's going to take years, but most cats are never going to be socialized if they're unsocialized to people. They're very happy outside. We want them to be content. So um, today, though, we know that there are hundreds of nonprofits that have organized just for cats, specifically outdoor cats. There are a whole 450 municipalities with ordinances. If you think that's something that you want to work on and that needs to be done, because a lot of the laws that have been created are not preventing TNR necessarily, but what they have done, there's lots of local ordinances that have created leash laws and licensing laws that are for owned cats, but these are unowned cats. But a lot of times they are, uh, uh, in a misguided attempt, the code enforcement animal control officers will cite people because they're caring for their own cats outside as if they're owning them, but they're not owned. And of course, everybody knows about, does everybody participate in National Feral Cat Day? On October 16th, you'll hear more about that this year, soon, this year's. Um, so there I am. We know that TNR works. This is a colony of 54 cats that I cared for with some other people and the neighbors in Adams Morgan, Washington, D.C. And after uh, about 10, 12 years, there was just a few remaining cats. And most of those cats, there were about um, six of them. And we actually, those six, we relocated to other areas, not because we wanted to, but the whole entire neighborhood um, that was caring for the cats had moved away, and there's a whole new group of people in the neighborhood. So um, my, my thing here today is that what we like to say, how many of you knew about, like, you're involved now, and when you first heard of TNR, were you feeding cats? Were you, uh, you didn't know about trap knitter return? You're probably feeding cats and didn't know there was something that could help you. There was maybe groups or fact sheets and videos. So we have all that good stuff, and Kayla's going to share that with you. But I think that what the, the theme here today, um, the, the underlying theme, is that what we have found is that people need to be empowered. People don't know that they can do this because we, over the years, took that away from them. We had a system, this entrenched system, that the public was bad and nobody could do anything. And in fact, if they tried to do something, they'd probably screw it up. And so what we're here today and what we've been telling people for 25 years is that, you know what, you can do this. And of course, we have call after call after call that, that Hannah's, um, sorry, that Kayla's going to share with you about people who didn't think they could do anything and that they have a full-time job. Maybe they even have a family and responsibilities. But certainly trying to, for a lot of us, it's just kind of foreign arena to pick up a box trap or go find a box trap and try to figure out how to operate it and put it in your car because then you have to lift this 25-pound trap with a, a wild, you know, this very, very frightened animal in it. And... Uh, what, I, what my belief is, is that people do have grit, that they have perseverance that they don't know about. What you want to do is tap into that. We want, what we find is people get empowered, they find out that they can do something, that this responsibility, that the more and more you send somebody in, unless it's somebody who really isn't capable of somebody that is older, that doesn't have a means, that doesn't physically have a means, that they might really, truly, legitimately need help, but those people who are able-bodied and of sound mind that they are they are able able and capable and when we tap into that it's just amazing and that's what we're going to talk about today um, so uh, we know that this issue a lot of people don't know about they just are not aware of what happens at their shelter they're not aware that this is going on all over they don't know that the majority of cats a lot of people think that the ch shelter of course they're going to do everything they can to find a home for this unsocialized cat so they can't, that they can't touch. So they, you just kind of have to set reality in place for them and say, no, 
They're not going to. And in fact, national average is that 70% of cats and kittens who enter shelters are killed there. That's still, now that might not be the case in Austin, that might not now be the case in San Antonio, but by and large, it's still the case in the United States until we turn that tide and we're looking at a, the large, large majority of shelters um, that, that are gonna be following what Austin's doing. It's gonna be following what Reno's doing. That's not the case today yet. Um, but the, the fact is people just don't know. So part of what we say to them is we try to kind of give them that bigger picture. Of course, they're calling about that one cat or that mother cat and kittens. And it's kind of hard for them to kind of get the little, you know, philosophical, you know, national perspective. But this is the fact, and we have to keep this in mind, that it's the number one threat to cats is, is going to a shelter and being killed there. And of course, we know that we often talk to people about and explain to them what the vacuum effect is. And some of them know this because when they've called, this isn't the first time that they've done something with cats. They may have already removed cats. They may have brought some cats in. They may have relocated them to maybe their uncle's farm or something. But they know that there's more cats. So a lot of people understand the vacuum effect. And this is why I have this slide up here, is removing animals just creates a vacuum. More animals that are intact, that breed right back to the, the capacity of that area. Area, and all you're doing is just kind of a vicious cycle, removing cats, um, and they go to a shelter, obviously, the majority of them, and then it just opens up that, that territory, that habitat, and more cats breed right back within the next year. And it, by the way, when we ever talk to animal control officers who have gone out and it's been the responsibility to remove, that's been their job, they do tell us that within six to 12 months, they know they're going to be right back in that area. They always, every single one of them admit that to us. So um, I'm gonna pass this off to um, uh, Kayla. Um, the reason we have this slide is because um, uh, what we have seen is that when people, what's, this whole movement has really been based on necessity because it didn't exist. We didn't have the, the TNR groups. We didn't have the trap banks. We didn't have the high volume spay neuter clinics. But it was a need. There was a, a, there was a tremendous necessity. And of course we all know this, this uh, slogan, this quote, necessity is the mother of invention. So we've built it, a lot of people have built it, and people have come, and that's what we're saying here today. So I'm gonna pass this off to Kayla. Thank you. Okay, so the rest of this is gonna kinda be about the calls that I field, which might be similar to um, some of the situations you're in, and it's also gonna be about giving you the motivation when you get home to get something going if you haven't already. Um, so the important part of planning is you. Um, that I can't emphasize enough that we need just one person to step up to make the difference. We kind of um, divided, you know, if someone calls and said, I want to make my community a better place, I kind of put it into three bullet points. So the first thing that I tell people to do is to define goals. So saying you want to make your community a great place is excellent, but let's kind of narrow that down and make it more definable. Um, so first, just research what you already have. You might already have a program going that you're not aware of. Um, so really looking into what already is in standing and then deciding where you want to go from there. Uh, maybe it is big enough that you want to make your shelter a better place. Maybe they are taking in too many cats and you want to reduce those numbers. Maybe it's something as small as your apartment complex is looking to get rid of all the cats there. Um, so it doesn't matter how big or large. Um, the first part is to just define the goals and see what you have. Um, the second, which is the biggest in my opinion, is networking with your community. Um, so this whole process does take people skills. You can't sit behind a desk and you know hope everything gets better. You really do have to reach out to councilmen or shelter staff or just your community. Um, I think a lot of people do call us and hope that we can just kind of make things better. Um, and we certainly will do everything that we can to do so, but we find that the biggest obstacles are overcome when people right in that community do something. Um, they wanna hear, you know, whether it's an apartment complex, they wanna hear from those tenants, those residents. If it's a shelter or a city, if you're going you know, even bigger than that, they still want to hear from those taxpayers. Um, so we recommend kind of getting a community together, getting a group of people who have the same beliefs. If you don't have a group of people, and I should have brought it with me, but we do have cards on our table um, 
It's right in front of the registration table, and it's our Feral Friends Network. So we've put together this network of individuals who already care for community cats. Um, they are the people you should reach out to. They're going to be the ones that are already caring and are going to be wanting to make their community a better place. So if you don't have kind of a network in place, I would recommend reaching out to them. Um, the third part is educating, and this goes hand in hand from day one. So again, whether you're educating your shelter or maybe there's a neighborhood that's really unfriendly with cats, um, you want to you wanna start there. That's, that's the biggest thing. A lot of people don't understand cats. They don't understand why they're outside. Um, so it's really all about educating them, and then that's going to you know, drive the force of people to, to get together and make a difference. Um, the link below, if you want to jot that down, that's a really good link if you have, um, it kind of gives you some feedback and really good talking points when you're talking with your community, whether that's neighbors, councilmen, shelter workers. Um, it also has some really good um, documents to present, so we call them truth cards, so they're, you know, really small one-page documents with a lot of facts that you can help in your presentations. Shelter transformation. So I wanted to touch on this since we are in the no-kill movement here. Um, the, the link below kind of has, again, a good website for outlining how to go about that. Um, again, you want to have your group of people. And as the opening uh, seminar, I think Ryan stated, if you hear no, you want to move on. So you might not hear yes from the director if you go right there. But maybe there's a board member who's really interested in trap me to return. Maybe there's a shelter worker that you can reach. Um, you want to get as many people on your side as you can. Um, our attorney at Alley Cat Allies, she's amazing and she's very realistic. And I watched one of her presentations and she kind of flips it on the shelter. So she's kind of the person who goes to these meetings where the shelter is kind of in between yes and no for accepting a trap and return program. And she says, what are you doing now? And usually the answer is they're catching cats and they're essentially killing them. Is that working? Are your shelter staff happy? Are your costs more effective? The answer is usually no. Um, so we kind of flip it to make it more... We, we kind of stay away from it's more humane. We all know it's more humane, but it's effective. So your costs are going to go down, your shelter staff's going to be happy, and overall it's going to be a better atmosphere. Um, the community is going to be receptive, so I think there's going to be a lot more um, fundraising and donations by the community. Nobody wants their cats, you know, to be killed there. Um, so really, you know, push the money side to them, and, and we can help you out with that. We have lots of um, documents about cost savings. Um, and this just goes back to education, too. So there are certainly some shelters who, you know, just really are stubborner in their ways or they've been doing the same things for so many years. But um, I know I personally worked at a shelter um, in Maryland prior to Alley Cat Allies, and they were a group of people I really respected, and they genuinely felt that bringing in cats and putting them down was helping the community, and that's what they preached. So... Sometimes they just need a little bit of education. They might need numbers. Um, the director might not be as interested in that you're a cat lover and this is better for them, but really the numbers that, that show that bringing cats in is just not effective. So I just want to go over um, a few cases uh, just to kind of give you some more uh, motivation and experience on what I handle. Um, so this was a big case that recently came in. Um, a woman from Boston, Massachusetts, she contacted us, and the FAA was looking to remove about 100-plus cats on the airport. Um, I actually learned from her research that the FAA usually, um, you know, removes all wildlife, whether that's birds, cats, um, they just don't want any wildlife there. Um, so we were kind of up against a big battle, being that that was kind of their policy. So her goal, she just wanted the cats to remain. They were all spayed and neutered. They had caregivers. So, you know, we outlined the goals, and then I connected her with feral friends. Um, she went from one person to hooking up with a new director at the Humane Society who was pro-TNR, which was huge. Um, and then we provided her with case studies, numbers, and the two of them uh, presented their information to the Massachusetts Port Authority 
And not only did they allow the cats to stay, but they also provided food and shelter to the caregivers. So it went from really looking pretty um, sad for the cats to just a little bit of hard work from just one person, networking with another one, getting some statistics, doing some research, and the cats are happy there. Um, I also, I mean, it doesn't have to be this big. I have, you know, I think the biggest number of calls that we get is um, individuals who work at either businesses or live in apartment complexes and the property managers want the cats removed. Maybe there's a nuisance complaint, um, neighbors don't want the cats. So right then and there, you know, a lot of people are discouraged and I, I encourage people to just try, try to educate them. It never hurts to hold a meeting and a lot of people are hesitant. Oh, they won't, they won't buy into what I'm saying, they won't believe me. If you don't feel confident, you know, work with feral friends, work with someone else who can give a presentation, but that's where you have to start. And usually once, I mean, we have the statistics, we have the numbers proving and backing up what you're saying. So we do encourage at least trying a meeting and, and really presenting those to those individuals. So you can make a big difference. Um, this, this advocacy webinar, that, that was um, it's going to be presented by our attorney that I was mentioning earlier. Um, and this is really good. It's kind of just a 101 for how to um, create community change, all the way from writing ordinances to maybe just holding a workshop with um, your neighborhood or your community residents to make a bigger change. Um, so if you have the time, I do encourage you to Look, look for this, it's on March 4th. Um, it is on Eastern time, but if you can't make it, um, I still encourage you to register for it and then you can view the recorded uh, session afterwards. And then I also included at the bottom our advocacy toolkit. So this kind of complements the webinar. Um, we did have some copies out at our table. I'm not sure if anyone grabbed one. Um, but that will have kind of the basis for um, you know, how to get something going. Another thing I wanted to mention, um, I do have a couple folders here. I don't have enough for everyone, but I just wanted to provide a sample of if someone calls me, whether they're reaching out to their director or if they're reaching out to their landlord, um, you know, where do we start? And the first thing I do is put these folders together. They will have our truth cards. They have our case studies booklet. Um, I'm gonna pull this. This is on our table. This I can't emphasize how important this book is. So this gives real life numbers, real life large communities who practice trap unit return and the cats have decreased. Um, so I would definitely pick this one up. But if you are ever um, in a position where you need assistance and you're meeting with someone, um, you can call us. I will make 100 of these folders for you and send them to whoever. We're here for your support. Um, we just need you know, one person to set up in each community and then you know, we'll guide you through the rest. Um, and then I know uh, Becky and I just wanted to kind of open this up for questions. So um, if anyone has a question for Becky or I or Ali Catales in general or how we can help you, um, just raise your hand and I, I guess bring the mic over. I'm not really sure how this works. Yes. Hi, I'm Elaine Morris. I live in Baytown, and we had a um, very large population in my apartment complex I live in, and I tried talking to the director of animal control, and he's very old school, and basically said, um, we spend all this money on TNR for your apartment complex, and then after the community dies, they're just gonna come back in. And so it's a waste of money. And I was just kind of dumbfounded by his remarks and tried to explain everything I knew about you know, how to correct this. And I have been working with a group in Houston <coughs> who I was taking abandoned kittens to and we were getting them spayed and doing TNR and so forth. And I was like, I can't keep asking them to pay for the animals in Baytown. We need to figure out something for in Baytown. So that's why I'm here is to find out, you know, one person, what, you know, how to how to do something. And there's uh, a house that's directly behind me that has a population of bobtails. I mean, or they'll say they don't have any tails, 
and I just keep <coughs> seeing babies and babies that I want to go, you know, try to approach them and say, what can I do to help with trying to get your group together? So that's kind of what I'm up against in Baytail. <laughs> Um, so first with animal control, so we get that a lot with the vacuum effect. I mean, a lot of people are like, well, what happens when the cats all die? And I think a lot of people think feral cats die in like a year and they live miserable lives, and that's not the case. Um, they can live nine, ten years. So, you know, you just kind of have to put it in perspective. You can either trap and remove today so that a new colony can breed in, or you can try trap new to return, have them all, you know, die out after five plus years and then, you know, just approach it that way. And I think for that individual, maybe he needs some reading on the vacuum effect to kind of prove that. I mean, we don't expect you to be, you know, an expert on it. Um, and then, you know, for the, uh, the apartment complex, I mean, I think that would be a good time for us to help you with literature um, and, you know, showing them how trap near return works. I'm sure that they have heard residents saying, you know, there's too many cats. So I'm sure it's on their radar. Now's the time to move in and say, like, don't say, how can I help? This is how I can help. Um, and I know sometimes cost and it is labor intensive. So I'm not sure if you've tried our feral friends list, but I would reach out to them. Um, I know I'm working with another coworker on getting trap me to return in our community. Ooh, that's hot. And, um, you know, right now, so we're working with the shelter size, but we're also working with the community. So we actually put on workshops once a month where it's really casual and we just kind of talk and gain volunteers. So that community relations link, um, that has really good information for hosting workshops. So that might be a good time, you know, even post in your, in your community. Um, I'm, I'm planning a workshop for, for cats. If you're interested, come, put your contact number. A lot of people are f probably feeding cats. They just don't know how to help. And a lot of them are probably taking them to the shelter thinking that's what they're doing is good since you don't have a program set up. Um, so like I said, just really getting in there and educating them first and foremost. Does that answer your question? Okay. And it's, it's easy to, it, it's very easy to not only feel alone because you are alone at, in that, in these circumstances right now because you're not connected with anyone. but. It's also easy, what we found is that um, every time we have this conversation, we explain there's such a big need that it's easy to immediately put your time, all of your spare time and energy into what the cats and the kittens need. And that's not a bad thing, but if you're not strategic and if you don't have a plan and you don't devote some of those hours to coordinating and networking and working with people and educating and kind of just getting your act together, so to speak, that that's what I found, is that I was constantly having to regroup because I was, years ago, I was by myself. And I was in my own house, at least I had a husband to help me. I mean, he, he does help a lot still to this day, but there were times that I had litters of kittens in my house, and I couldn't stop and get organized and think about putting on a workshop because I had baby kittens to feed. And then I had to get up on Saturday and bathe all of them and bathe myself and go to the adoption fair all day. So it, it was like a, you were kind of in a, I felt like I was in a vicious cycle. But, but so I had to constantly kind of step back and I, you know, lots of, you know, lectures from my husband. You know, how are you, is this what you're gonna keep doing this or are you gonna kind of get, get organized and figure out how you're gonna get help? So what Kayla's describing is that once I did get organized, <clears throat> and this was in Arlington, Virginia, and I decided to just, this this you know, epiphany came, I thought, I should just go and put on a workshop. And you know, again, we're talking about workshops where I had to find the, the VHS player. So I found someone that gave me an old from their office, one of those that was a VHS player with the TV, you know, the little one, and I found a cart, and I set it up at the community center, and I you know, took my little VHS tape, and I put it in, and I had my little trap there, and of course I had to take it with me because I had to use it that night, later, right? <laughs> And so I did all this, and immediately what we found then and what we're finding now where um, Kayla and Hannah are working in Montgomery County is that years later, it, the same thing happens, which is people come, and then people get connected, and then they, you kind of just carry the, you just pass the torch. They start putting on the workshops. They start conducting them. And it was, you guys know there's really cold weather right now in um, the east. 
and um, uh, it was almost that cold, and it was a January, and I had gone ahead and scheduled, this is what we're doing in Montgomery County, we schedule these and we announce, we put out flyers and we announce when it's gonna be the third Thursday of every month and you just hold it like clockwork no matter what. And then you make sure that you have that flyer out and you, you tell the Humane Society if you, I befriended people at the Humane Society at the front desk and I told them please tell people if they call about cats that there's gonna be this workshop and that they should come. And lo and behold it was a January and it was right after a big, you know, the holidays, and it was very, very, very cold temperatures, and I decided not to go. I just thought, well, who's gonna come? And the guy at the community center, Larry, called me and said, Becky, you have 11 people standing outside in the cold waiting for your little workshop. So don't, don't underestimate that, like what Kayla's saying, that people, you're gonna, it's just gonna take time for people to, to connect with them, and they're gonna be just as needy, but you're gonna kinda have to help each other. Um, and the education is key. I, I like the fact that, Kayla, you said that, you know, we have these materials. Did you guys all see a copy of it over there? We were trying to pass them around so everybody got um, to see what's inside them. And, uh, you know, we have other literature besides that. And a lot of people also say, well, <clears throat> you know, I really, really worry about them outside. So we also say, well, there's some inexpensive shelters. There's some places that you can go to buy them or you can make them. So you can kind of get people to understand that there, you just, it's a lot of education. And there are some people who can't let go of what they've got in their head about these cats. It's gonna take them a while to kind of get past that this, is, this, that this neuter return is the best thing for them instead of bringing them in. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Kelly with Friends of Arlington Animal Services. And we've been doing TNR for about a year and a half. Um, I'm curious about where y'all are going in the future with shelter new to return or return to field because uh, we were shelter volunteers and to get to the dog area, to the cat area, we had to walk through the wildcat section and we knew every one of them was gonna die. And that's why we called y'all and Liz came down and we got TNR passed in our city and we've, we've returned to field almost 2,000 cats in like a year and a half. And it's, it's, the intake has gone way down. We're still working on tweaking the um, ordinance I'm working on that with the board and the staff. Um, I talked to the Fort Worth manager, and I'm thinking about the nuisance clauses is a big issue that I think a lot of people is gonna be in the future about. Um, we wanna redefine what a nuisance is because right now in our city, any cat in a trap is deemed a nuisance, which is ridiculous. Um, it, I've talked to a lot of people about just a cat on your property can't be deemed a nuisance. I just was wondering what y'all thought about that, that topic, because that's what I'm working on right now. Because if I can get the nuisance clause changed, then I can get fear coming in and get the ACOs to stop picking up. No, I, I think that, um, I think that in answer to your question about where we're going with this, does everybody know shelter need to return? Is that now something that everybody's familiar with, at least in this room and I'll, for the, the recording? Trap to return is what people are doing on their own. It's very grassroots, and of course, you're identifying a colony or an area, and individuals are, of course, then connecting with the neighborhood that's caring for those cats, and of course, new, taking them to a clinic, and then, of course, recovery, and then returning them. What shelter need to return has kind of become, or sometimes it's also called RTF, because in most shelters, there's jargon called RTO, which is return to owner, but since Cats who are living outside, they, have their, they, they own each other, they're family groups, so there is now um, RTF, which is return to field. So it's the same as return to owner, this is they're going back home. So in response to that, Kelly, shelter need to return is when shelters are still now realizing that they have to be a part of this solution. They have to now, it can't just be that, that Individuals everywhere are caring for colonies, but the real, when we know that there is a tide has turned and we're in the right direction, like what we're doing in Montgomery County, it's not good enough to just have individuals do this on their own. In order to really change the community, we have to get the players that be, the shelters, the animal control, we have to get those people. They are the ones who are being paid with our tax dollars. They have the authority and the policies and that's who people usually typically call, or their local veterinarian. So this is intriguing, Kelly, that you've returned 
more than 2,000. But the thing is, we have got this thing in our heads, and there are codes that are on the books, that have been on the books for years, that are really just outdated. These are punitive laws, and they don't fit what, what we in society are experiencing. It's almost like that these codes thought that if we just passed all these local ordinances, somehow this was going to fix this issue of cats outdoors, and that it was going to fix people. Because people in America, people want things perfect. I mean, you've seen this. You've all gone, gone someplace, whether it's a restaurant or a store, or you've stood in line, somebody, even at 7-Eleven, and they demand everything has to be perfect. Everything they want their way. We're very, we're a very demanding bunch of people. And what, we, what we're doing, what all of us are doing with the social change is we want people to understand this is the way it is. This is a natural thing. So when it comes to cats, and you're seeing the, whatever they think is a nuisance, a lot of people have been taught that just a cat outside just shouldn't be there. So we have to change that mind. Lots of education, lots and lots and lots of education. But the other thing is we have to also get them to realize is that when cats are neutered, things change, their behavior. So this is a lot of what we have as our literature is saying, this is how they act differently. They're, they're neighbors, but they're going to even, we're kind of like training them just like teenagers <laughs> to be better neighbors. And so it's a lot of this education, like the, one, it could be that the ordinance are changed, as you're saying, Kelly, but two, it could also be we have to get our officials, we have to do training we have to kind of retool and retrain our shelters and our animal control, and we've done that. We've done that in Wake County. We've done that in a number of areas where, in Montgomery County where we have interacted with the, the, sh the staff because they themselves have to have a whole new wrap. So it could be that that's one of the first things we do besides just changing the ordinance because people think that that's all they're going to do is make a phone call. But cats who are outside and they're neutered, they're going to be different. They're, they're not going to be fighting, so they're not going to hear the noises at night. They're not going to be mating. All those things that we associate with unneutered and unspayed cats is going to change. We're going to, you're going to flip that. You're going to see a complete difference in their behavior. Do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, just, I mean, you're the expert as opposed to your shelter. So, I mean, even in Montgomery County, we kind of team up with the rescues and the shelter. So I think, um, I mean, really successful shelter need to return programs are when um, they take part in the aftermath. So um, maybe someone calls or brings in a cat and then they educate them. And then once the cat's returned, that's another opportunity to go out there and assess the situation, speak with neighbors, and maybe that's something you can get volunteers to help with. You do. Okay, great. Do you, did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Oh, I probably don't need this. Um, I'm from Fort Bend County, and um, I've spoke with animal control officers at like a f public forum, and um, they are just they think feral cats are like the worst thing ever. <laughs> you would think that they like. So do they, aren't my neighbors. They think that they destroy property, and it's really ridiculous. Um, how do you, do you think it's possible to change the minds of these people? Do you think that they, I mean, I've, we've provided facts and I just think it's like a lost cause with them. I mean, I think the whole shelter staff needs to <laughs> get wiped out, <laughs> like what they like to do to the animals. Um, and another thing that's really scary about Fort Bend is um, we have really high kill rate and feral cats aren't even included in the numbers that we've been killing. They aren't even... They never enter the shelter. I've seen them personally just get brought to the side and then right into the EU room. They don't, I mean, every cat's scared when they enter the shelter, so it's scary. Um, I was actually on the news um, a few months ago because someone in my neighborhood was trapping neighborhood cats with a trap provided by our county um, and baiting them, and neighbors' cats were getting EU'd. Yeah, so it's a really big problem with us, so it's a big fight. Um, so what is the overall shelter, I mean, so is animal control affiliated with the shelter or animal is the shelter? Okay. And I'm assuming they don't have any, do they have employees there? Yeah. So, I mean, 
I think we tread lightly with getting media involved, but in this situation, okay. I mean, I, and Becky, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in this situation, since you know, you've had meetings, you provided the facts, now it's time to put pressure on them. It's time to show, show them that the community is not happy with them. Um, and we do have resources on our website for getting media involved. Um, do you think? Yeah, I, I think that, um, <clears throat> I think that what, what I would, would advise is there are these models, you know, Reno and San Antonio and Austin, and there's several others. I mean, now, Alicadais, we've been in Wake County, D.C. Our, I mean, we've been in a number of communities. And we first need to get organized. That, that's what we found. And even in San Antonio, they have a, a terrific, I mean, just because I was there two days ago, and I wa they sat through, I sat through and, and, and they explained how they got organized. The fact is, the, the community has to be organized. That those that are carrying out, they're carrying out what they've been doing. And, and for us to think that we're going to go and change what they are, and this is me too. I worked for the state of Kansas. I was a bureaucrat. I wasn't a policymaker. I wasn't elected. I, nobody, nobody could vote me in or vote me out. I had a supervisor that gave me an annual review. And I did my job. And it might not have been what should have been done. I mean, I started to realize after a few years it was other ways to do my job that I started learning. That was just because I you know, kept my mind open to that. But those, what we're dealing with is the status quo. So to change the status quo, the public's going back and getting organized. Our First Amendment, we have to organize and we have to, to, to address the government, our grievances. But we have to do that collectively. Because if it's an individual, what you've noticed, you all know that person that writes the letter to the editor, that you see their letter to the editor almost every month, and after a while the paper stops publishing because they write this same thing about the complaining about the public works or the transportation or whatever they're complaining about. So if it's a single lone person, they're not going to be, at some point, they're not going to be considered credible. Your credibility is going to come that you're going to be organized, you're going to be, you're going to be having your own facts together, as you said. If there is any way that you can find out, transparency is very difficult. Getting data is sometimes difficult because if they're not keeping that track of that. But you might, you might find that out in other ways. There's other things we can talk about afterwards. But um, it's, it's really, really just to get organized and get all the step back aways and get everything together, and then start having your own public meetings. It might not be open to the public. It's public meetings that you're going to have, maybe even invitation only. If you hold them at the library, it has to be open to everybody. So if you hold it in your living room, it's private, and you can ask anybody you want. You can kick out anybody you want. So there's things to remember that we started holding a lot of, lot of meetings in my living room around those kittens that we, I was bottle feeding, come to my house, come to my living room, and I, I will have these meetings. And by the way, you'll help me with all the cats I'm trying to help at the same time. So another question. Hi, I'm Celise Shuttlesworth. I'm the director of Friends for Life in Houston. And um, about a year ago, we started a program called Fix Houston. And it's the first ever public-private partnership with the city of Houston to do TNR. And we do all the cats, they do the dogs. And we're moving through the neighborhoods, kind of like a military campaign. And we've, we've organized it to do a targeted approach. We started in 77009. Median income there is $19,000. Um, it's 68% Hispanic. And when we first rolled in with, um, with the city, and you know what a wasteland Houston is and what a wasteland bark is. Um, and the reputation of Fort Bend, God love you. <laughs> Thank you for being there. We, well, come on. Um, but if people were terrified to even participate. We, we announced this program, and the first surgery day we held, uh, people would walk up to us with this cat and kind of trembling say, are you sure you're not going to kill this cat? And the city took us because we have a reputation. I mean, we're the no-kill shelter in Houston, and so they thought, you know, they get our name out there, they would trust this program. And now we've done, uh, and I'm just watching my phone, my, they, they, they're just up to 60 cats in the trapping today so far. Um, and so far, with this, this will be 700 cats trapped through this program it's in a year. So it's a very exciting, different thing. The city is really open to it. Um, and now we're on our ninth surgery day, and people are seeking us out. That people will walk up and say, I brought my brother-in-law, I brought my, no. But then they got a good result. Right. You're going you're gonna to 
what you're going to see is that there are people that care. They're not the ones, the shelter's not going to put them in touch with UAM control. So you kind of have to go and find them. And it's going to be these little workshops. It's going to be networking. I mean, those people are, are individuals. They're not plugged in yet. And so it's going to take time. I guess that's. But sometimes it's not year. even that much time. With inside of a year, you're going to see a difference. It's been crazy. And I'll tell you the, what, what I. I'm been amazed about is that block walking works. We block walk. Block walking. And that's really just, good. That's we, a good tip. We, we're out two or three times a day knocking doors because there is a Mrs. Kravitz in every neighborhood. Yeah. And and when they don't open doors, we leave them a little gift. Yes. We, leave, we can see they're feeding cats. We leave them our business card with a free bag of cat food. That's really good. Then they Calling call us back and say, you know, then they know we're not out to do anything to them. We just want to help them. And, right. oh, I got free cat food. Maybe I'll call. And we had the same experience in D.C. We did the same thing. And it took a while because they just... That there had been such a hostility towards people caring for cats for so long. So well, I think we're out of time, and um, but we're here the whole rest of the weekend. We're here um, today and tomorrow, and you know how to reach us if you've got our card from our um, exhibit table and you know how to reach the National Cat Help Desk. And please don't hesitate to contact us or corner us here while you're here um, this weekend or contact us when you get back home on Monday. We really, really want to be of help to you. Thank you.